So on to problem three. We want to use the even odd properties of the trigonometric functions to find the exact value of a given expression. And we want to do this without using a calculator. Let's move him up a little bit. We want to do this without using a calculator. So we're going to need to use our even odd properties. So uh, when we use our even odd properties of cosecant, we know that cosecant also refers to uh, sine. So cosecant of negative 120 degrees is the same thing as saying one over sine of negative 120 degrees. Sine in this case is an odd function. This means that if sine takes on a negative value, sine will then become negative. So now we can get negative one over sine of 120 degrees. So now we want to find the value of this problem. So this just means that we need to find the point that corresponds to sine of 120 degrees. Um, if we want to do this, we could use the unit circle, um, anything along those lines. So sine of 120 degrees is going to be the square root of three over two. This would be in radians five pi over six. So now we have this value and we wanna simplify as much as possible. So we have a negative one over the square root of three over two. So we know that one over a fraction, we can just reverse the fraction. So this means that now we can have a negative two over the square root of three but we don't like having square roots in our denominator. So we'll multiply by the square root of three over the square root of three in order to get negative two square root of three over three. So we use our odd property in this case, or the even odd property, but odd because sine of this is, and ends up being odd. Um, and so we were able to actually find the numeric value of this problem using the values given from our unit circle and knowing that when we take the sine of a negative value, we end up just getting negative sine of that value, the positive version of that value, which then we can easily find on our unit circle. So all right, that wraps up problem three from section 6.3. Now for section 6.4, number four, we wanna graph the function y is equal to three cosine of x. Show at least two cycles and then determine the domain and the range. So with two cycles, this means that we wanna show two periods. And we're given this function y is equal to three cosine of x. So we're gonna go ahead and use the method of using key points in order to graph this function. So remember with using key points, and we'll write this here using key points, we have four steps, three written steps. The fourth step is to graph. So when using key points, we wanna start with step one. And remember step one is finding the amplitude and finding the period. So the amplitude is given to us by y equal to, in this case, cosine of omega x. And a, we see here is equal to three. So our amplitude, which we then take the absolute value of, is going to be three. Then our period is given to us here. So our period is corresponding to the omega in the equation of form y is equal to a cosine of omega x. 
But since I see that we just have cosine of x, this means technically it's cosine one times x. So our omega in this case is just going to be one. So we get that omega is equal to one. Or here, we'll write this before. Omega is equal to one. So when we find the period, we know it's two pi divided by omega, which is just one. So our period of our function is still two pi. So just like in cosine normally, it has the period of two pi. This function also has a period of two pi. So we need to show for two cycles now. For step two, we just want to take our, we want to take a period. Um, so any given period that we want, we can take a period and then go ahead and, uh, sorry, mind blank for a minute. We want to take this period and separate it into four equal sub intervals. So we're going to take that period divided by four, and that's going to be the length of each sub interval. So as an example, let's pick the total interval of zero to two pi. So we want to divide into four equal sub intervals. We know that our period is two pi. So two pi divided by four is going to be pi halves. So our sub intervals need to be, or need, each need to have a length of pi halves. And we're looking between zero and two pi. This means that our intervals are going to be zero, pi over two, pi over two to pi, pi, let's, let's pi, pi to three pi over two, and three pi over two to two pi. So these are our four sub intervals that we're going to need to be looking at. Now, from our four sub intervals, we want to go to step three. Let's actually move this a little bit so we have some more room for step three. So, step three, we want to identify our key x values. Our x values in this case are going to come from our endpoints of our subintervals. So our, our endpoints are going to be 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. So we're taking these x values, plugging them into our original equation to find the corresponding y values. So with our y values, we know our equation is y is equal to 3 cosine of x. So our first value will be zero. So we have y is equal to three times cosine of zero. So cosine of zero, we know is just one. So this is just three times one, which is three. This means that our key point is going to be at zero, three. Then our next value, pi over two, we have three times cosine of pi over two cosine of pi over two is just gonna be zero. So we have three times zero, which is zero, which means that our next key point is gonna be pi over two comma zero. Then our next value is going to be pi. Cosine of pi is gonna be negative one. So we have three times negative one, gives us negative three, which means our next key point is pi negative three. Then our next point is pi over two. Cosine of pi, sorry, three pi over two. Ooh, forgot that three there. So cosine of three pi over two is also going to be zero. So we have three times zero, which is zero, which means our next key point is three pi over two comma zero. Then our last key point here, we have y is equal to three times cosine of two pi. Cosine of two pi is going to be one. So we have three times one is equal to three, which means that our next key point is two pi comma three. So these five points here, these are our key points. 
So we need to go ahead and graph our key points. And remember, these are just key points for one single period. So once we graph these key points, we want to uh, continue on our graph. And using our key points, we can fairly easily figure out where the points in our next period is going to go. So all right, let's start graphing. So we have points zero, three. So if we go ahead, label our graph a little bit, one, two, three, negative one, negative two, negative three. We also have our negative two pi, negative pi, pi, and two pi labeled. But let's go ahead and label pi halves and three pi halves as well. So all right. So our first point is at zero, three. And our next point will be at pi halves zero. And our next point will be pi negative three. Our next value is three pi over two, zero. And our last point, two pi three. Now I wanna go ahead and connect these points. So our graph is going to look something like this. And there we go. And that's for one period. Now, if we want to do this for two periods, we're going to take what we know from our first period here, and we're going to continue this on in the negative direction. So, we know that cosine is an even function. This means that whether or not we plug in the negative or positive version of an angle, it's still going to give us the same answer. So this means that we have symmetry about the y-axis. So at negative pi over two, our point will be at zero. Then at negative pi, we'll have negative pi negative three. Then at negative three pi over two, we're gonna have zero. And at negative two pi, we're gonna have a positive three. So now we can draw in these points as well. All right, now it's pretty as the other side, but we get the point. So our points here became two pi, positive three, negative three pi over two comma zero, negative pi, negative three, pi over two, zero. This is zero, three. And just like our original key points here, we had the same y values for the negative versions of our x values. But here we are, we have graphed the function of three cosine x. Now the last thing we wanna do is determine the domain and the range. So with our domain, we're determining where our x values can exist. And actually our x values will continue on forever. So our domain would be all real numbers or another way we could write this would be from negative infinity to infinity. Then our range, we see our graph is going to alternate between all numbers between negative three and positive three. So our range will be in our square brackets here, negative three to positive three. And there would be our domain and our range of our function. So all right, that wraps up our problem four there from section 6.4.